I've taught for years and years, and literally now decades I've taught. You are what you do, and you do what you are. I have a lot of people say, well, I'm this and I'm that, but their life doesn't show that to be true. And I believe that by understanding faith, we can understand how we apply that to our lives. And uh, for the for, for the long term of this teaching, we'll eventually have this, and we're going to self-publish these study guides. We're not we're not going to use a publishing company or anything like that. So, give you a little a little. Uh, Next, Sister Nancy is videoing this. I'm, I'm looking away from my tablet that I'm going out on Facebook Live with my tablet, and I'm looking over here to my left at this camera. Sister Nancy will take what's on that camera, and she will edit that, and she will put that on YouTube. And uh, so it'll, it'll, it'll be there for a long time, and it's available. And uh, just as a commercial now, a disclaimer, the doctrines here in this study are the doctrines of Bill Sanders. I'm the teacher, so I get to set the I get to I get to set the boundaries. Uh, I don't claim to be perfect in my knowledge or understanding of God's word, uh, or even in my interpretation of the Scripture. But the goal here is to aid the church family, and not just young world, but the church family international, wherever, to aid them in their faith, in unity, in love, and and help them find anything and everything they might need. Now, when we look at the word faith, and we go back and we do a word study, uh, it's kind of a curious thing. Uh, there are two basic in uh, definitions in the in the Word of God about faith. Number one is belief in that which has no tangible proof. Tangible proof. And the other definition is so simple. It's so simple it's actually profound. Faith is trust in. God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trust in God. Mm -hmm. So, we'll have to trust the Word of God. That's a part of faith. Trusting the Word of God. But, it also, faith also talks about an element of active obedience. See, we can, we can think obedience, but is it actually active obedience? We have to put it into, that's, that's why I come up with that, you are what you do and you do what you are. You're, you're putting, your obedience is becoming active. You don't do certain things because you trust God's word that says they're wrong and, and, and that they would be an affront to God. Now, in this definition of faith, we have to remember, too, that we, we need to accept Christian teachings of the Word. We have to accept them as truth. As long as there's been a Bible that's been available to people, there's always been somebody questioning it's validity. Mm -hmm. Always. I had a conversation with a person not too long ago and they said, well, the Bible was just written by men and so I don't particularly care to believe what a bunch of men all those years ago had to say about things. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, is that how you approach knowledge and how you ex approach education? Is if some men wrote something a long time ago, you don't believe it or you don't yeah. 
Uh, so, so you don't believe anything that was written about anybody else in history that some man, somewhere in history wrote it, that some man wrote it? Is that is that your criteria or for your doctrine or, or your boundaries for life? And of course, it didn't have an answer for that. It didn't get an answer because there is a one. Uh, I think faith, if we're going to define faith, we have to think of it as something that can be embodied. And when I think about faith and faith being embodied, I, I think about some of the Old Testament heroes, you know, like Moses, Abraham. Your faith, what's in here, I, I consider to be the truth. That's my faith is in the Bible. Right. But my faith is also in other things because we have to live day to day in a world that is not living by the Bible. And it makes it almost impossible sometimes for us to carry on a conversation with any other human being. Yeah, it, it, it does. does. In certain subject in certain subject matter, we don't have any we don't we're not relevant to them. They're not relevant to us. That's why I was telling you earlier, we're gonna make our faith relevant to the life we're living. Uh, I've, I've been asked many times, why do you do this or why do you do that? Well, I say, I do that because the Word of God says, you know, yeah. I, I've even had other Christians say, well, why don't you raise your hands and shout so much? <laughs> well, I said, why do you go to a football game and get surrounded and shout? Uh, exactly. It's because you're excited about something and it's relevant to you, it's meaningful to you. And God's just relevant to me. He's meaningful to me. Yeah. And I want to worship and praise Him. And, of course, you know, I came up at Old Time Pentecost. And you, you know the rules of Old Time Pentecost. <laughs> One of the reasons I fit in so well, the louder you are, the more spiritual you are. <laughs> 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 well, guess what? That's not true. But, uh, Does that go to games, too? Football. Well, I don't know. People are more rambunctious and hollering and raising their hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Sure. Yeah, that, I, that I, I, I've used this before picking at some of my friends, you know, be, be somewhere at a Ranger baseball game with some of my Baptist friends, and they're yelling, yelling and shouting and rowdy and everything. I said, man, you don't act like that in church. <laughs> so you, you, you love this baseball game more than you love God? You know, they just, of course, Brother Bill, leave it alone. <laughs> well, you know, Paul had a thorn in his flesh, and sometimes I think that's what God's got me here for, is to be somebody's thorn. <laughs> well, God made us all with emotions, how we use them. That's right. <laughs> yes. We all have emotions. <laughs> yes. And, and, uh, and believe me, uh, we, we, we need to use our emotions. And though we found the people that don't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I'm thinking about people like Moses and Abraham, you know, we 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 read the Bible about their faith and how it worked, what they how they worked, and, and uh, but you know, there's really no difference between us and them. We we need our faith to be embodied in our life, our faith, our conduct, and all that we are, all that we do. And uh, I think that's good. Now, when I started doing just the basic word studies to get preparations for this, I found out that the word faith itself, now, and just, I forgot to mention this earlier, but everything that I'm drawing from, unless I tell you differently, it's going to be from a King James Version Bible. Now, I, I use other Bibles and I, I refer to them, but I tell you when I do. Uh, so when I'm when I'm talking about this word study that I'm sorry, understand I'm studying this word in the King James Version of the Bible. Faith doesn't appear but a couple of times in the Old Testament. Only a couple of times. So we say, hmm, does that mean they didn't have faith? No, because then we have to look into the deeper meaning and the and the, the broader meaning. 
We have to look at things like believing, and we have to look at things like, like uh, truth and trust. And then we find out that there's a lot in the Old Testament. In fact, faith is first revealed to us in uh, people's confidence, the confidence they had in the covenant that God made with Abraham and his descendants. You know, there was a tremendous amount of confidence that went from generation to generation to generation after Abraham. And when God called Abraham, what did, what did God ask of Abraham? What's the first thing he asked of him? Do you remember? Especially, especially 
some of the some of the psalmists when they were in the darkest places of their life is when they expressed their faith the most though God slay me yet will I trust him I'll praise him in the moon, in the noon time I'll praise him in the morning I, I, I'll exalt my I'll exalt him when when I'll exalt him when my enemies are camped all around about me. Whether I'm on the mountain or in the valley, I'm going to believe my God. And you know, uh, one of the minor prophets, Habakkuk. Habakkuk. I never pronounce his name right. Well, I you know I. Sometimes if you just say it fast enough, people won't pay attention to the fact that you missed a little bit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's the one that coined the phrase for us, the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. An Old Testament minor prophet tells us that the just shall live by faith. And But the prophets were constantly sharing the ingredients that add up to faith. Trust, the obedience, even to reverently fear God, respect God, uh -huh. and uh, and they dealt. The prophets dealt with a lot of the the certainty that God was going to just go so far, and then He's going to do something. For some, that gave them faith to hold on because it's just a hit. You know, I, exactly. Some, sometimes when we're in the middle of some of our battles, we're holding on to that promise. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. He is. You know, uh, I want to just kind of leave the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament there for a little bit. We're going to the New Testament. You know, the faith in the New Testament took on its fullest dimension that we will understand, that we will relate to. Uh, because of, uh, in, the, in the process of the New Testament, the New Testament is God's final revelation to us about who Jesus is. The New Testament showed us Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. But he was our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He was also our Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. See, in the New Testament, we get into this language thing to where we find out that faith is used as a verb most often in the New Testament, but faith is also used as a noun in the New Testament. Because at, at what? what That's a verb. Is verb is action, but what's a noun? Person, place, thing. Person, place, and thing. And we're, we're, we're called people of faith. Mm -hmm. That's when faith is used as a, as a noun. And uh, let's kind of jump into back and forth. I know I'm I'm yo-yoing I'm here a little bit, but let's jump all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In that garden, Eve was begotten. And she became the first example of an individual failing to trust God. Or, i.e., believe God. Mm -hmm. God said you could have it all except. And that's spelled E X, not A C C. Why I've struggled with that particular <laughs> word so much. She was given specific instructions. Now, here's where I've got the preacher. I have to hold back the preacher. 
Because how many times has God shown us in the world word specifically what we can and can't do, and yet we warp it, twist it, ignore it, whatever we do. But God was so specific about this tree, wasn't he? We can spend all kinds of time preaching about this situation, but what the serpent did was plant the seed of doubt. We know that Eve had to have a pure mind. Don't we? But even someone with a pure mind so if she had a pure mind, she had a pure heart. And how did the enemy attack? He attacked her in her believing. And as he attacked in her believing what God had said to be the facts, he planted that doubt. And then the trust became the issue. So we find here that Eve Tempted, tempted by this doubt thing, she exercised free will. And, and by the way, this is the first place we have where we see God's creation, humanity, exercising free will. Like to see it in the Old Testament, 
It's certainly there. It's certainly there. Now, let's talk about a couple of guys that we don't talk about very often. Let's talk about Cain and Abel. They both brought offerings to God. Now hold on. As acts of believing that he was a God. That he was worthy of an offering. Hmm. So this tells us that they both believed that God existed. That he was real. Not only did he exist that he was real, but he was worthy of worship. Because remember, their offerings were a part of their worship. Hmm. So they're admitting by the very fact that they're bringing these offerings to God, that they were a part of God's creation. I don't know how much they had learned from their mom and dad. I don't know how much had been passed on from Adam and Eve. We don't have anything in the Word to show us details. But we find that here at this point, God is still prominent as God. Now, let's talk about these offerings. The animal that Abel brought was an acceptable offering. Why was it an, an acceptable offering? Say it again. The shedding of blood that we learn about later in Scripture, but you're right, that's that it represented that. And Jerry, you yes. said it was the best he had. It was the best he had. It was also representative of another lamb that we learn about later. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember when it talks about a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth? Well, uh -huh. that first offering that we hear about from Abel, the acceptable one, was for us telling us that this was acceptable to God because it was a type of his son Jesus yes. who would ultimately save man from their sin. But there was the other offering. Why wasn't Cain's offering acceptable to God? Because the ground had been cursed. Number one, the ground had been cursed because of Satan's deception and Satan's lies and what he did to Adam and Eve in the garden. Are there any other reasons you can think of why it might not have been acceptable? One thing that comes to me is maybe that it wasn't really given from his heart. Poss possible, well, we can, we can understand that really easily and we can identify with that. Scripture doesn't give us a real clue. Though. I mean, but you're, you're fine. I mean, it's just, but we just don't have a real clue. You know, I've heard so many different interpretations of why. That, that, that this wasn't an acceptable offering. Well, uh, the lack of blood, it wasn't his first fruit. I think that that has to be the key. And For me, it is. Yeah. Right. Is that there was no there was no blood involved in this sacrifice, in this offering. Uh, they both required a lot of, of diligence. They they both required a lot of uh, of. Uh, work and effort to obtain these offerings uh, and the fact that they were being brought as offerings uh, we go back to the fact that both of these men were professing that I, I worship you as God I, I exalt you as God and they were the first fruits also the first fruits 
and 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 we, and we see we we see later in the in the in the worship of the Jew, the Jewish rules and regulations how they used oh, grain and bread and different things that were were from the earth. But I I've got a, I've got a little clue for you. I'll show you how that's going to work here a little bit. See, as God begins to speak to Cain, you know this is a pretty pretty deep conversation between Cain and God. See, God reveals to us in this conversation that it really wasn't the offering itself. See, my lady, this is kind of leaning to what you were talking about. Uh, but there was something inside of Cain that wasn't right. His heart? His heart. He didn't trust. Yeah. Respect. Respect. He didn't believe. No faith. There was a lack of faith in one of the offerings. It was just not there. And the very fact that what was in the heart of Cain motivated him through jealousy to kill his brother shows us that in Cain there was a missing element of trust. Yeah. If somebody comes up here and they, they, they walk into church and they put an offering down and we don't receive that offering, does that really mean that there's anything wrong with the person that offered it? No. If I can go back, there's a couple of times and well, I think I think it happened to me twice. I can only remember one right at the moment, but uh, many years ago, a man offered me a a nice offering, but he made the mistake of telling me that he won the money played poker. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept it. Now if he come up and offered it to me today, I would accept it. Because I'm, I, 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 just, I, I just had the wrong perspective back then. Uh, I, I, would, I would receive the offering that was given to me. Uh, I, I wouldn't, if, if, if somebody killed somebody and took their money from him and then brought it to me, I wouldn't accept that. But if it's just from gambling, I, could, I just dedicate it to God, and sanctify it, and put it in the book, and use whatever God wants us to do. But the fact that we don't accept an offering doesn't change the validity of what the offering is. And it shouldn't change what's going on in the person's life if we don't accept it. They bring an offering down the road, we don't accept it. Take that offering, give it to the Baptist church, they accept it. Fine, doesn't matter. It shouldn't change the person. But see, there was something missing in Cain's life. It was almost still like the person who offered you that offering was tempting you in a way, right. just testing you to see. At the time, that's exactly what they were doing. Yeah. Because I had been preaching against a lot of things that were very common and very, you know. And Elm, Elm Grove had some pretty rough characters in the early days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They'd been through a lot of things. And, uh, and back in the early days of my ministry, I was more a, 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 a cop for God uh, than I was a pastor. I was, no, you don't think so? Well, I, I tried to police a lot of things. Let me say it that way. I, 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 I tried to guide these people you know, with rules and regulations and laws and things like that. Mm -hmm. I did a lot, but uh, you, you know, the funny part about it is they still love me. They still love me. Even, even when they didn't agree with me at all, they still love me. So I must have been doing something right. <laughs> so this missing element of trust, Cain took matters into his own hands and look at the terrible price he made. Now, we're just we're we're we're, we're going to run out of time before we get too much further. But I want to I want to jump into uh, and talk a little bit about Noah. I want to talk a little bit about Noah, and I want to talk about how the faith, the faith, a man that believed 
God, a man that trusted God, made the difference for all of humanity. One man, one righteous man. God was upset with what he created. But I love the way the word says it. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, that I can always find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because he believed God. Well, and don't you think that over the course of about 120 years, that faith had to be tested a little bit? But Can you think about every Monday morning getting up and Boys, we gotta get this thing built. <laughs> or something that they'd never seen before. Yeah. They'd never seen the rain. They'd never seen the flood. They'd never seen rain. They didn't understand what God was asking them to do. And and remember at this point, God was only talking to Noah. He wasn't talking to a committee. <laughs> he wasn't talking to a denomination. He wasn't even talking to Noah's sons. No. He was just telling them he this was, is what we're doing. He just came down, he said, I'm your daddy, and this is what God is, wants me to do, and I'm going to do it. And his boys res respect their dad. Think about it. Think about it. They trusted their dad. There was a lot of trust dad. there, too. There was trust everywhere. Yeah. The whole picture is just trust. And everybody was laughing at him the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, they were not a politically correct family. I know. How many of you can put up with all those animals? <laughs> well, you know, we tease that about that, you know, about all the animals coming out. But remember, for the most part of the time, the animals didn't come in just right at the end when the ark was all were complete, you know, and then God shut the door. But there for 40 days. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He believed. They were in there longer than that. That's how they, they were in there for months. There was a lot of dumb. Yeah, there was a it was, it was, yeah, I, when I was reading this and going over and doing a little bit of background study and things like that, I came up to that place in the, in the, in the record of Noah where, it's, where you know, they, they've, been, they've been up on the flood and then they settled out on Mount Ariat and, then, and, and, and that's the only time it says that he opened the window. <laughs> you, you know what went through my mind? You mean they did in this ark all this time and they didn't even have a window open? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> they grew immune to it. <laughs> well, Sister Nancy, Sister Nancy has told me several times that, you know, you get used to a certain because yes. she can smell odors that I can't, I just cannot smell. Yes. And, uh, one time when I was preaching years ago, I made a mistake. How did I say? I don't smell good. I smell bad. I smell bad. Yeah, I smell bad. I don't smell good. I don't smell good. And, uh, and, and he had to go out. Well, at, at least it was funny and it wasn't vicious. You know, it was true. But, uh, that, that, that thought just hit my mind. He, he, was there any possibility that they were inside that ark that whole time without it even having a vent open up? Sure. Not. Well, well I, I didn't think so, but that's for them. And I just don't know by what words. But it didn't say that he opened the window for the first time. No. He no. opened it up that time. And there could have been vents underneath the thing. Well, I just don't know. I, I, there's, there's no vents recorded in the text. So anyway. <laughs> Get back on course here. <laughs> he trusted what God told him, and he built that thing. Mm -hmm. Now that's not faith in action. Mm -hmm. That's yes. active obedience yes. to the words of God. He trusted God. You know, you know, I built it all, built a lot of stuff, but to build something on that scale, yeah. on that scale. And have it all fit together and work. I've seen it. You, you, did you get to go see the one that they oh, built up there? Yeah, it's amazing. It's great. You have no well, that's sister, sister Nancy and I have. We we have been talking. You know, of, yeah, we've been we've been we have made a decision that 
somehow, some way, we're going to take more time for ourselves and rest a little more uh, and, and, and uh, get our batteries recharged a little more. And, uh, and, and so that's one of the places that I'd like to go. There's a lot of places where they have provisions for all the animals. So you can actually walk through it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Walk yeah. Three stories. That's awesome. Well, that'll be on our list. I ran into a car. <laughs> uh, right on? Yeah. Well, I will do that. Yes. Uh, as, we, as we think about a man like that, trusting God, it, it, uh, it brings us to the to the next part of Noah's experience is as soon as they get off the ark, what's the first thing that Noah does? He builds an altar. He builds an altar. And that altar there again brings us back to that idea of blood sacrifice. You were looking for rocks. <laughs> For those, for, those of you, for those of you on the viewing online here, Sister Nancy just reminded Brother Ron that uh, Noah built his, he got his stones, he built his altar so that they could make his blood sacrifices. And Brother Ron is our resident stonemason. And uh, he preaches more more sermons and, and gives us more information about stones and how they, and, and the parts they play from Genesis to Revelation. We enjoy it. And so we, we tease him about it a little bit. Notice, notice when God is accepting the offerings of Noah, God re rescinds the curse off of the earth. Yeah. Read it. Mm -hmm. as, as, as God is accepting the sacrifices, and he's telling Noah, he said, I'm going to put a cloud in it, and I'll no longer curse the earth. He uses those very words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He uses those very words. That jumped right out of me. And he tells him, go and replenish the earth. God says, go replenish the earth. I'm going to put this bow in the cloud. I'm going to make this covenant with you. And he's going to say, look, here are the boundaries of the covenant. You can do this and you can do that. You can't do this, you can't do that. It's beautiful. Genesis 9, 9 says, and I behold I have established my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Mm -hmm. Glory. We pass this on from generation to generation. That is cool. Genesis 9 and 9. And then Genesis 9:13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Mm. Well, I, I, I'm, I, 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 that's as far as I can take this tonight. Mm -hmm. This has all been kind of preliminary to get us started, but uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to jump into the book of Genesis next week, and we're going to just... There, it, I know I'm not supposed to say it this way, but folks, it's just going to get gooder and gooder and gooder. <laughs> so, come in and, and join with us and and we'll enjoy it. It's good to see Pauline on there, and Robert, and Linda, and Sherry. And, oh, it's just so good to have you on us tonight. Uh, hope you didn't have any trouble finding us tonight. We're, we send it out a little bit different. We send it out through primarily to friends of Adam Grove. Oh, you shared it back to Michael. Well, that's probably when they started getting online. Okay, God bless you. We'll see you next week. Same bat channel, same bat station. <laughs>